Well, excited to be with you this morning, excited to be in the Word of God this morning as we are in a sermon series through the summer here at Cornerstone, walking through the book of Daniel from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 12. And each week as we gather, we're reminding ourselves of something that is exemplified by this book, and that reminder is that we are exiles. This is not our home and that our citizenship is in heaven, our allegiance is given to Jesus as our King, and as we are on this earthly journey of this exile, our call is to faithfulness to Jesus and faithfulness to follow in His footsteps. Now, as we have come into chapter 7, uh, we've entered into a very different kind of tone from chapters 1 through 6 in the book of Daniel, and it's a different kind of genre of literature called apocalyptic. And this word apocalyptic means to reveal or unveil, and these chapters are reminding us that the world that we live in is a very vibrant and alive world, not only with the world that we can see, touch, and experience physically, but a spiritual world, which is then communicated to us through various symbols and metaphors, and we've been walking through that over the last number of weeks. Now, as we come into Daniel 9, which is our reading this morning, it's a bit of a reprieve, if you want to think of it that way, uh, from some of this apocalyptic imagery and literature. And what we'll be seeing this morning is that Daniel 9, at least the first two-thirds, is a prayer. And what we will be doing in our reading by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is being able to listen in and to hear this prayer of this great saint, and he's crying out to God in the midst of the exile that he and the people of God are experiencing in Babylon. Now, as we read this, this this prayer is a little long, it's 19 verses. It also can feel a little bit repetitive, but that what, but basically what Daniel is doing is revisiting the same kind of themes over and over again, which again highlights as Daniel is praying what's really important to him, and as we'll see in our time in the Word, what should be important to us as well as we pray our own prayers. So I invite you to stand. If you are new to Cornerstone, we stand in honor of the Word of God and its reading as we listen in on this prayer of Daniel in Daniel 9. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, that is, the Babylonians, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord, to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from Your commandments and rules. We have not listened to Your servants, the prophets, who spoke in Your name to our kings, princes, and fathers, and to all the people of the land. To You, O Lord, belongs righteousness But to us open shame as at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame, to our kings, princes, and fathers, because we have sinned against you. But to the Lord our God belongs mercy, to Him belongs forgiveness. For we have rebelled against Him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in His laws, which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against Him. He has confirmed His words which He spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us this great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that He has done, and we have not obeyed His voice. 
And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, and as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, and your holy hill. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O Lord God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for her own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name, for we do not present our pleas because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, yes, this is the prayer of Daniel. But we thank you, Holy Spirit, that as you inspired these words, these are also your words written for us, your people. We pray, Holy Spirit, that just as you inspired Daniel, you'd be present with us to inspire us as well. We pray that you'd open up our eyes that we would see, open up our ears that we would hear, open up our hearts that we would understand, turn, be healed, changed, and transformed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, quite a prayer, huh? Quite a prayer. Our message this morning is entitled, Praying in the Storm, which should bring us back to some of the images that we were looking at back in Daniel chapter 7, the vision that Daniel has of the sea that is churned up by the waves and the beasts that come out from the sea as the people of God are in the midst of the storm being swallowed up by the beasts that are represented by the human kingdoms, in this case, Babylon. And Daniel and the people of God are in Babylon in the midst of that storm, and Daniel is praying. Now, this prayer is a model prayer for us in many ways, and I hope that our time this morning in this prayer will help us as we also cry out to the Lord with our own voice in the midst of our own situations and circumstances. It's by no means the only model of prayer given in Scripture, perhaps not even the best, as the model prayer that would be best used for a believer is given by the Lord Jesus Himself which is given to us in the form of what we call the Lord's Prayer, found in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. That being said, this is a tremendous prayer, and it does serve for us a model as we cry out to God. And what we want to see is that as Daniel is praying, he is doing so very grounded. He, Daniel is grounded in the Word of God as he is praying to the Lord. He is grounded in God's promises found in Scripture. He is grounded on man's need, as described in Scripture. He is grounded on God's conditions, as grounded in Scripture. And he is grounded on God's character, as grounded in Scripture. All that this prayer is soaked in is the Scriptures. And may we, as the disciples of Jesus, be soaked in Scripture as well. All of us, no matter where we are in our walk with Christ, can grow in the knowledge of Scripture, that the Word of God would be the lens by which we view everything else outside and inside of ourselves. So let's see how Daniel has Scripture ground him in his prayer. So the first is that Daniel's prayer is grounded in God's promises. What Daniel is doing is praying God's words back to him. One beautiful thing about Scripture is Scripture reveals to us promises that God has made, and a privilege for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is by the Holy Spirit to pray those promises back to God. That's exactly what Daniel is doing. We see this in Daniel 9 verse 2 where Daniel has before him open the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah. He says there that I perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. 
There are two places in the prophet Jeremiah where this is mentioned, the 70-year time period. One of them we looked at about a month ago in Jeremiah chapter 29, where Jeremiah was contradicting the false prophets writing and speaking to those in exile in Jerusalem, saying that their time of exile or the time where the Babylonians would you know, be there causing trouble would be rather short. But Jeremiah writes to the exiles in Jerusalem saying, it's not going to be short, okay? You're in Babylon, plant some gardens, okay? Build your houses, give away your children in marriage and have children because you're not going to be there for a couple years. You're going to be there for 70 years. So seek the peace of Babylon because when you seek the peace of Babylon, in its peace is your peace. Again, we looked at that about a month ago. But another place where this promise is given is also in Jeremiah 25. And here's what that passage says, that this land, that is the land of the the kingdom of Judah, will become a ruin and a waste, and the nation shall serve the king of Babylon for how long? Seventy years. And then after 70 years are completed, there will be a punishment upon the Babylonians and for their iniquity, thus says the Lord. Now, what we don't know is whether or not Daniel is reading Jeremiah 29 or 25, but we do know that he is immersed in Scripture, he knows the promises of God, and he's praying them back. You are a faithful, promise-keeping, covenant God. This is what you've said, and I'm praying it back to you. Do we know the promises that God has made? And are we calling out to Him according to what He has revealed to us in the Word? Or are we calling out and praying to Him for things that He hasn't promised us? I think a lot of people are crying out to God with prayers that remain unanswered because they're asking for things that God has never promised. You know, if we face trouble in our life and trials, we pray, God, you promised in your Word I'd never have trials. I wouldn't suffer. If you pray, does the Word of God promise we'll never have trouble? It's exactly the opposite. Jesus says you will have trouble. So do we know the Word? Do we know what the Word of God teaches so that we can cry out to Him according to what He has said? Now, because the Bible says, yes, you will have trouble, but guess what the Bible does promise in the midst of those troubles? That you can have joy and you can have peace. We read passages of Scripture like Philippians chapter 4, which says, be anxious for nothing but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Is that a promise? You bet it is. So the Bible doesn't say you're not going to have trouble. The Bible never says you're not going to get sick. The Bible never says you're not going to have financial issues, relational issues. But the Bible says that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil, for you are with me. So believer, as we're walking through trials and we begin to feel alone, we begin to feel abandoned, we begin to feel like God is not with us, Guess what? You can cry out to God, God, you promised me. I'm walking through a valley, and the shadows are long, but you promised you would never leave me. You promised you'd never forsake me, and you promised that if I lift my requests up to you, thanking you for who you are and what you've done for me, that there is a peace in the midst of the storm, and you can calm the troubled waters of my heart, even if the troubled waters of the world around me don't stop churning. That's a promise, and we can cry out to the Lord on the basis of what He has already told us in His Word. That's what Daniel's doing. But he's also crying out within a context, and he's crying out within a context of a problem, and he's crying out according to a very fundamental, as we look at what he over and over again refers to in in his prayer, of the problem of man. He is, yes, he's crying out according to God's problem, but he does so in the context God's promises according to the context of man's problem. What is the problem with mankind? Sin. Sin is the problem with mankind. You know, Daniel 
understandably, I mean, if you were in Babylon and Jerusalem had been destroyed and the temple was destroyed and you're under a foreign rule in a foreign land, I mean, you could have said, like, hey, God, here's the problem. I really don't like these foreign rulers. They don't rule over us with righteousness. They keep trying to throw me in these pit with lions. I'm just not down with that. You know, I don't like the food, the water. You know, I just don't like it here. I miss Jerusalem. You know, you could see how Daniel could have been talking about the problems that he was facing on those kinds of terms. But Daniel knows, and we should know with him, the fundamental problem. It's the problem of sin. Now, sin has all sorts of symptoms. There are as many symptoms of sin as there are people expressing that underlying problem. But as believers, we need to dig a bit deeper than simply the symptoms. What's really the problem? If, if we go into the doctor because we have a headache, this is a common illustration. The doctor does well to give you something to alleviate the pain that you're feeling. But if the doctor sends you on your way when what you have is really cancer, the doctor has not fundamentally helped you. The doctor is simply helping you mask the real problem. And what is the real problem? Sin. And here's what we see in Daniel chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, where Daniel's outlining this. He's saying, look, we have defied you. We have sinned. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. We have rebelled. We have defied you. We act in defiance against your laws, against your commandments, and against your rules. Lord, you give us these rules not because you don't love us, but because you do, that these are there for life, and we have turned away from them. We've turned to death. We've turned to things that are destroying us, and we have stopped up our ears so that we no longer listen. One thing that the book of Romans chapter 1 is, says is that all of mankind knows that they should honor God, but they choose to substitute the worship of the true creator for the worship of creature. And in so doing, they turn away from life and they embrace death. And that is the fundamental problem of all of humanity, have turned aside from following the one true God. And Daniel, remember when we prayed at our opening reading over and over again, we've sinned, we've sinned, we've sinned. It was like, it's like a merry-go-round you can't get off of. And he's praying because he understands that God's promises meet us in the midst of our greatest need. And the greatest need of humanity is to deal with the problem of sin. Now, when Daniel is praying, he also is praying, seeing that the reception of God's promises come with conditions. He prays about God's conditions. Is it interesting to consider that the blessings of God and the promises of God are not unconditional? If we were to say that God's promises are unconditional, we can say that but we would simply be universalists. That's what a universalist would believe. A universalist, that's a word that just simply means that all of humanity, every single person is saved. It doesn't matter what they do, they're just saved. And, you know, there's no conditions to that. But we know that in the gospel, as the apostles are sent out in the book of Acts, as an example, they don't go out into all the world going like, you're saved and just move on to the next town. <laughs> they... They present the gospel, which says that you're a sinner, and you must repent. And Daniel understands this. Daniel sees that the situation that God's people are in, in this case specifically being exiled into Babylon from the kingdom of Judah, was foretold in Scripture. He says, what has happened to us was already revealed all the way back into the Torah, all the way back into the first five books of Moses. And what has happened to us was foretold even there. And what Daniel is referring to are passages of Scripture, like the book of Leviticus, like the book of Deuteronomy, which outline stipulations 
a being relationship with God, and that relationship takes the form of a covenant. For those here this morning that are in relationship with Jesus, your relationship is in the form of a covenant. Say that word with me, covenant. Even as the Lord Jesus Christ comes in His earthly ministry, He says, I came to fulfill. See, what Jesus does is fulfill the covenants that were given through the Hebrew Scriptures in Himself. I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. He is the greater Moses. He is the greater David. He fulfills those covenants. Even as Jesus is in the upper room with His disciples, before He is given over to be crucified, after the meal, He takes the cup and He blesses it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. When you are saved, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you are entering into a covenant relationship with Jesus, with the Lord through Jesus and with Him as God. And in the book of Deuteronomy and in the book of Leviticus are given blessings that flow through obedience to that covenant and curses that flow to rebellion against that covenant. Now, when we use the word rebellion and curses, it might be helpful to think about this in a familial kind of way and saying that what is happening in Deuteronomy and Leviticus is outlining discipline that the Lord brings upon His children. Because God is a loving Father, and a loving Father disciplines their children. Now, just as a loving father, loving fathers here would discipline their children, God also, in very like measure, amps up the severity of the discipline over time. So if, you know, little Johnny or Susie, you know, a little child does something wrong. By the way, what's the purpose of discipline? Is the, is the discipline to make you feel good for making someone, you know? The purpose of discipline is restoration, and the purpose of discipline is to bring a child that is acting in ways that are harmful to the child and harmful to others and to bring them back so that their actions and their dispositions are no longer harmful to themselves, harmful to others, and dishonoring to God. It's, you're bringing them in a direction of life from a direction of death. That's what hopefully discipline does. Now, if little Johnny or Susie does something wrong, and it's not, you know, you shouldn't do that, right? It usually starts off with something that's pretty small. Don't do that. But after they've done it 500 times, you're probably like, you're grounded for a year, right? So you started from don't do that to you're grounded for a year. And, you know, God's a lot like that. God disciplines, but the discipline of the Lord, which is meant to restore you and to bring you back from death to life, is amped up. And it is, if you don't do it, if you don't listen to me, if you don't heed my discipline, this will happen. If you don't heed my discipline, this will happen. If still you don't heed my discipline, this will happen. If you still don't heed my discipline, this will happen. And it just keeps ramping up until you get to the very end of God going, look, I've been trying to tell you for like generations and generations and generations and generations. Okay, look, eventually here's what's going to happen. If you finally will not listen to me, at the end of this process, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove you from the land. That land that was good that I gave to your fathers, I will scatter you out, and you will live apart, and your cities will become a desolation and a waste. This is what happens to the northern kingdom by Assyria and the southern kingdom into Babylon. That's why Daniel can look back in Scripture and go, this was already way back there. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, God promises, because He's a good Father, that He will restore the people. I will scatter you among the nations, but I will restore you if it's conditional. What is the condition that the people of God must meet in order to receive the promise of restoration? Repentance. That should sound familiar. If you confess your sin, and if you can confess the sins of your fathers, if you confess the rebellion 
and defiance and deafness which you have brought upon yourself by rebelling against me, if you confess it, so that I acted to bring you apart out of the land, then I will remember, then I will act, and then I will restore you. In Daniel's prayer, you can go back later today or later this week and look at it over and over again. That's what he's doing. We confess, we confess, we confess, we confess, we confess, we confess. Why? Because Daniel understands the deepest need of the people is their sin. God has promised to restore them if they confess, if they repent, if they confess their iniquity. And he's doing it over and over and over again. Of Not only it says like they need to confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, and that's exactly what Daniel's doing. He's He's confessing the sins of our kings, our princes, and our fathers. We have all sinned against you. And he's doing so, throwing himself and throwing the people of God upon God's character. When we repent, we are throwing ourselves upon the Lord only on the basis of who He is, not on the basis of who we are. That's what he says in verse 18. We do not present our pleas because we're great. We present our pleas because you're great. It's not because of our righteousness. It's because of your great mercies. You see, what Daniel is doing, he's praying according to a pattern. And that pattern of what Daniel's praying according to, we can call the pattern of the gospel. See, what is the gospel? The gospel is the proclamation of the promises of God, and those promises are tremendously huge. The promises of the gospel. What is the gospel promise? What's something? Eternal life, the forgiveness of sins. What is the gospel promise? Restoration, salvation, reconciliation with God. What does the gospel promise? We should have that on the tip of our tongues. What does the gospel promise? Do you know what the gospel promises? Because if you don't know what the gospel promises, what are you telling people? The gospel is a promise of all that we've said and more, that you are separated from God in the pursuit of of maggots in the dirt, and you are eating it thinking that you are going to gain life from it, where God is trying to pull your head back from the mud and point you to the eternal sun, where true life is to be found, to sit you down at a table with eternal meats and wine and precious food. That's what God is trying to do, to take you out of the mud and seat you at His table. And the promises of the gospel is if you will believe on him, he will take you from the dirt and he will seat you and cleanse you and clothe you with the robes of his son's righteousness. You will be accepted at his table and you will sit down and eat forever with him in eternal communion with other believers. That you will be accepted as a child. Even as the voice cries out to the Lord Jesus, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The promise of the gospel is that you will be accepted as a beloved child, a beloved son, a beloved daughter, where the voice of the one who made you, formed you, knit you together in your mother's womb, who you have rebelled and spit in his face, will look down upon you and say, this is my beloved child, my son, my daughter in whom I am well pleased. It is to be adopted, to be made a part of His family. It is not only that, it is to be seated with the Lord Jesus Christ, to reign with Him, to be a fellow and co-heir with Him over a kingdom where we will be fellow rulers with Him and a new creation where our sins which separated us from Him will be removed as far as the east is from the west. He remember them no more. He will blot them out for His own name's sake. And the promises of the gospel meet us right in the midst of our greatest need. Because what is sin? Sin is choosing to eat maggots in the mud. Choosing it. To think that there's life there. To turn away and to find the broad road of destruction as being pleasing over honoring our Creator who made us and is calling us back to life in Himself. 
But that promise to receive all that is conditional. And that condition is what the New Testament refers to as faith, to believe on and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, to cry out to Him to save us, to pull us out of the pit, and to set us and to wash us clean. It is the cry not only that we would be saved, but that He would be our King, that He would be our Savior, that we would follow Him. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself says, count the cost. Because when we follow the Lord Jesus Christ, He says, you must deny yourself. Pick up your cross daily, follow me. And if not, you cannot be my disciple. You see, being a Christian means believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, seeing He is my Lord and my King and my Savior. I belong to Him as a citizen in His kingdom, and I will follow in His footsteps imperfectly, praying and confessing, but He's my Lord and I love Him. I don't deserve this, but He is my life. Where else can I go? He is my Lord. And we do so not because of our worthiness, Oh, Lord, save us from that. By grace you have been saved, by faith, not as a result of works that none may boast. I don't know about you, but in my life, I, the friends that I have that don't follow Jesus, not yet, I pray for them. The biggest reason I have is I talk about the gospel with them is basically they don't think they need it. They don't think that they need it. Why? Because they're good enough. Until you see yourself and your fundamental need is your sin, which has separated you from God, you think, well, I can set scales on two ends of my life, my good deeds and my bad deeds, and guess which one is going to outweigh the other? Well, it's going to be my good deeds, and so God, if He's just, is going to let me into eternal life in heaven. And basically, everybody's getting into heaven, except for, you know, Hitler. Hitler. Stalin or someone else. That is a fundamental risk reading of what God has revealed in Scripture, which says that the human heart is fundamentally wicked, deceptive, turned away from the Lord, that people are no longer lovers of God, they are lovers of self. They are lovers of money. They are lovers of pleasure. And the call of the gospel is the upward call to love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength as our neighbor as ourself. So I pray for anyone here this morning that has not yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel, that you are still pursuing life in some other way. It's a cul-de-sac of death. You will never find life. It's forever going to be the rainbow. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to really think I could reach that rainbow. You know what I'm saying? I, I got on my, I remember this, I have a memory of getting on my bike when I was in elementary school, going as fast as I could because I thought I could tell where that rainbow was. And guess what? That's life for a non-believer. They are chasing that rainbow. And no matter how fast you are on your bike, or in your car, or on a plane, or on a jet, you will never reach it. But in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, there is life. And if that's you and you have not yet believed, I love to, as we close it, I love to pray with you. I love to give you an opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to claim Him for life, to recognize your sin, to recognize your need for Jesus, to claim Jesus, I am simply not believing in you. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord so that I no longer follow this path of death. But there might be many people here this morning as well who think, you know, kind of been there, done that. Yeah, I, I remember when I recognized that I was a sinner and I believed in Jesus and I, I, I prayed the prayer, right? So, let's go. If that's you, or that could be me, let's remind ourselves. We said at the opening of this message that Daniel's prayer is a very good one, very good one. But it's not necessarily the only prayer that's given to us as an example in Scripture and perhaps not the best. And we said that The best and the model prayer that's given in Scripture is given by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. We call the Lord's Prayer. And just to think for a second how Jesus structures that prayer. He begins by telling His disciples to pray by adoring God. 
to honor the Lord. Our Father, what? Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. That, that there is this adoration, this lifting up of the name for God of who he is, what he's done, that his kingdom will come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he turns his attention to the daily lives of the disciples, to the daily lives of you and I, saying, what? Give us this day our daily bread. Let me tell you something. What you need isn't primarily found at Meyer. What you need in life is by the filling and presence of the Holy Spirit. Give us this day our daily bread. Do we know, Lord, I can't get through this day without you. I can't do it. I've been trying to do this thing recently called uh, intermittent fasting, you know, intermittent fasting. I mean, here's the point. I get hungry. <laughs> That's the point. Am I that hungry for God? Do I thirst for God? Do I hunger for His Word? How long can I go before I visit with God to be with Him? He is my daily bread. But notice the very next thing that Jesus says. Give us this day our daily bread, and then what? Forgive us our debts or trespasses, right? Depending on how you're raised. The point is, Jesus instructs those that would follow Him that every single day they should confess their sins. Why? I, I thought this was a one and done. I thought I believed on Jesus, I confessed my sin, and He saves me, and I just kind of go on, right? Why would Jesus, who is God, command His followers to daily confess their sins? I think it's good to remind ourselves that the gospel which is the good news that sinners can be saved because of the finished work of Christ as they believe on Him and the promise of eternal life. It's not something that you believe and then move away from. It's not like the starting line that, you know, you, you, you run from one place to another. The gospel is a found, it's like a foundation of a house. When you build your house, you build your house. This is what Jesus said, the foundation of the rock. You build your foundation of your house upon the foundation of the gospel, and then the house is built up on top of it. You don't move your house off the foundation. It's nuts. But Christians, do we build the house of our lives off of the foundation of the gospel, which is never something that we're supposed to move away from? The gospel is something that we dig deeper into. The gospel is what is the rocket fuel of our lives to propel us onto growth and godliness to better understand the promises of God. Even a second, what are the promises of the gospel? Do we need to go deeper in those promises? What is our need as a sinner? When you look at the life of Paul the apostle, through his life, he had a greater understanding that he was a sinner, a greater understanding. Do we grow in our understanding of our need, or are we like the, what Jesus described as people who are really good at noticing specks in other people's eyes and not noticing logs in our own? Do we better understand what Jesus has done so that we live a life that overflows in thankfulness? Knowing that it's not because of our righteousness. This is the final thought here. In my life, when I move away, which look, we can all do this, from a practice of prayer and confession, when that is no longer a part of my daily life, Here's what happens to me. I become full of myself. I begin to think, God is very lucky to have me. And that is stupid. It's stupid. And the people that know me best know that's true. And the better I would know you, the better I know it's true of you. The only reason that we can be saved, it's not because of ourselves. It's because of the mercy of the Son of God. That God loved you enough, not because of your righteousness, 
but because of his steadfast love that he would live a life that you could not. Died a death in your place. As you believe on him, you're united with him in that death. Buried with him by baptism. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so we are raised in the newness of life. And that's life eternal. Believe in and on the gospel. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. And Lord, I pray for anyone here right now who has not yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that have not yet trusted in Him for salvation. Lord, I pray even now they can pray along with me in these words saying, Lord Jesus, I recognize my need of salvation. I see my sin. I see how I have rebelled and turned against You. I see that You are worthy of what I have turned away from by not worshiping You. And I believe on You. I place my faith and trust in You. And Lord, I know that as I pray this, that You promised that those who believe on You, You give the right to be called children of God. And I believe on Him and I promise that I will follow Him. And Lord, I pray for all of us, even those who believed in the gospel 50, 75 years ago, that that gospel would be brought anew and afresh into our lives right now. Lord, I pray that all of us would not leave the gospel, but dig deeper and build our house upon the foundation of the truth of the promises of God that meet us in the midst of our sin as we believe on Him for salvation, as we know that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. We thank You. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.